Good evening, and welcome everyone to another Ataya seminar hosted by HUMA, the Institute for Humanities in Africa at the University of Cape Town. I'm here in Cape Town, South Africa, with some of my colleagues here, some of them at a distance, and our uh, speaker tonight, Dr. Atakleti Baraki, uh, who is here from uh, Ethiopia, who is uh, live streaming into the seminar from uh, Addis. And I met uh, Dr. Atakleti Baraki last year in Harare in Zimbabwe in November, just by chance, I was up there um, doing a research project um, investigating uh, um, healthcare, healthcare workers and hospitals in Zimbabwe as part of the research team I'm part of here at HUMA, looking at the role of emerging technologies in healthcare in Africa. And I was staying for a couple of nights at the Bronte Hotel in central Harare. Mm -hmm. And I overheard the people at the next table talking about um, humanities and medicine. And it's an unusual enough combination to talk about those fields together that I thought that I should introduce myself and start a conversation with the people at the next table. And the, the person who, who was speaking at that point was Dr. Atakliki Baraki. Um, uh, and he was there as part of a wider project. And uh, Atakliti is uh, a fellow and a program director at the College of Surgeons for Eastern Southern Africa. And he's president of the Surgical Society of Ethiopia. Um, uh, he's also an executive member of the Ethiopian Plastic and Reconstructive Surgeons Society. And he's also an artist and a graduate of an art academy. Um, and through the Smile Train project, he has brought smiles to more than 4,000 cleft lip and palate uh, patients. So we're really happy to welcome Atakliki here. Um, we are particularly interested at Humor in interdisciplinary work. And with our research uh, strand that looks at uh, medicine from a humanities perspective, and also for myself personally as a practicing artist who's using art as a means of researching um, healthcare issues, and I'm working on a collaboration with medical workers. Uh, yeah, we're all really interested in the area in which uh, Dr. Atakliti is uh, working. So without saying, uh, saying much more, I know that the topic that uh, Atakliti is gonna talk about is about bridging these areas. He's looking at various um, uh, ways of interpreting that and shaping that, but I'll leave that to Atakliti to outline for you. Um, and he also has a visual presentation. So we'll have about a, about a 30 minute presentation and then we can have a discussion afterwards. We'll play it, we'll play it by ear. Uh, Atakliti, are you, uh, are you ready? Would you like to go? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for uh, the introduction. Uh, without uh, taking much of your time, I would just go uh, and uh, uh, present my talks. Yeah, if you'd like to go full screen on that, then um, yeah. there you go. Oh, you go back one. Perfect. At the end of the presentation, I would expect all of us to uh, understand the definition of humanities, medical humanity, and uh, I would briefly discuss on the brain model and the functional windows. And uh, lastly, we will discuss on the four pillars of humanities in medicine. Issues related to the practice, issues related to the training, the patients and the environment. In summary, um, there is a, a limited role of medical humanities in modern medicine. And I think it's also better to explore how the brain is functioning in natural sciences, those are included also those practicing modern medicine. And also we have to understand the remarkable benefit of um, humanities in acquiring essential skills, enhancing our behavioral expression and other benefits. These benefits are related to the medical training, revision of curriculum and the training of undergrads and postgrads. And also, if there is any benefit for us, for medical health providers, specific advantage of the patients, and also we'll explore the advantage of uh, making our health institutions human. Before going to uh, go into the depths, I would like to say a few words on what makes us human. We are quite different from the animal world, from the animal communities, that we have the right, we have the identity, we have the emotional sensibility, 
we are living in a creative world and we are sensible and also we practice a thing kind of culture so whatever kind of human interaction is there it should be able to address those important uh, characters of a human humanities it's a broad term it's a broad subject that encompasses culture philosophy and creativity it used to be called um, the study of divinity and later on the study of classics it's not a hard science it's very different from the hard science because it's not following um, uh, rigorous research or uh, it's not like mathematics it really goes on having this speculation and critical thinking and there is a, a global movement to incorporate uh, natural sciences into this uh, humanities so that those people could understand the human being and understand the society part of the humanities that is dealing now in medicine is called medical humanities these are some of the subjects that are related in the that are in the under the umbrella of humanities fine arts sculpture applied visual arts literature drama and so on if you go back to history the human history is shaped by humanities and you can see uh, on one of the, uh, the sides, the uh, Southern Spain painting in the cave, uh, which uh, from uh, artistic point of view is not lesser than what we have in the modern world. And on the other side, you see the prominent picture or feature of uh, uh, Florence. This is uh, the Santa Maria uh, church, the cathedral. It was built in the 16th century. It is the icon of this city. 1989 was a very remarkable time for global politics when we had this uh, the berlin wall was uh, taken down and there was a very big celebration the berlin celebration and they uh, they shared symphony number no. nine and the conductor was um, leonard bernstein on the other side art has also a bad side when it comes to reflecting um, reflecting uh, human suffering in uh, a very negative way so in ancient korea for example they used to have masks that are depicting the negative side of clefts and also during that time you know dwarfs people with control pleasure were uh, forced to use uh, to 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 play a, a comical role and this is a publication from uk and it was published in a magazine after uh, seeing a patient who's cleft. So even the terminology they used was a monster child was born in Kent, which gives you a very negative connotation when it comes to the human suffering. Even though Leonardo da Vinci uh, sketched uh, these two important sketches, but the sketching was uh, were transmitting or conveying a very negative image when it comes to the human suffering due to uh, cleft. On the other side, there were also some historical records, uh, historical sculptures in the Southern America where they were uh, cleft patients were depicted as an uh, as, um, important member of the community. So uh, we, we should really examine uh, what uh, is lacking when it comes to well-being and what is now the modern medicine. And um, when something is wrong in our body, we have three perspectives. The perspective of the patient, the perspective of the care providers, and the perspective of the, the public. So these perspectives, they can overlap, but they are quite different. This is, is what you see, what we physicians uh, explain in terms of pathology, in terms of physiology, and the illness is what the patient is experiencing, which is more or less a subjective thing. And also the societal perspective is what we call sickness so anything any intervention that you do should be able to address those three important spheres even if they have overlapping surfaces this is when somebody is sick we have this dissociation the first thing is the reality of mortality you know when a person is uh, told about um, a disease that is fatal like a ca cancer and so on uh, uh, the feeling that the patient has quite different from the feelings that we have for, for the patient, it is quite, uh, quite remarkable. It's um, a death sentence. For us, uh, we are not that much affected emotionally or otherwise. And also the context of illness is very different. We are biomedical, but it is just a small part of uh, disease process. 
this uh, the philosophy of disease is, is very narrowed when it comes to our thinking pertaining to disease. And also we have what we share, the shame, the blame, and the fear. Patients would blame themselves, even they can blame us. They could uh, attribute uh, their practice and their way of life, the life cycle, the lifestyle as a, a contribution to their problems. And also they have a lot of things about their belief. Like for example, if you have uh, cleft patients, the parents would believe the cause could be quite different from the, what you, you know or what you have read. So basically we have uh, a very important uh, uh, three pillars. Can you see the slides? Yes. So you have the human body, which is a physiological and a pathological process. But on the other side, we have the emotional and the spiritual course. And also, as I said before, there are also cultural, familial, and other psychosocial consequences. And as long as we don't bring these three things and act on them, it is very difficult to, uh, to provide a person-centered care. But if we are able to, to, to combine all this and uh, uh, coordinate in such a way that they are, they are at risk, then we'll have a very good patient-physician relationship and we'll be able to understand also the patient. In the other side of illnesses, our bond will be very strong and patients will feel that they are heard and understood and ultimately well-beingness will be would be the ultimate outcome. But unfortunately, modern medicine uh, uh, is very narrow in terms of addressing all this. And uh, probably I'll come back to it later on. It has lost the art part, the subjective part. And uh, for me, modern medicine is science because it is uh, passing through rigorous uh, experimental processes from observation, animal models, and so on, until a fact is practiced as um, the best practice. So it's basically evidence-based and it's focusing on the physiological and pathological changes. Ultimately, we'll have guideline uh, based on the best practice. And if this is not working, it will be absolute. So we have challenges in modern medicine. I'm trying to relate this later on with uh, the benefit of humanities. The first thing is it is profoundly dependent on advancing technology. And we have been natured the human body into compartments. Nowadays, medical reductionism and butcherized medicine is a very common practice. A cardiologist wouldn't uh, think of the kidney, wouldn't think of the skin, wouldn't think of the, the social and psychological aspect of the patient. And the body of the patient is really reconceptualized re into systems and into compartments. And we are trying to shift, we are already shifted from uh, the subject part of medical care to the objective part. And I can see a clear cut dichotomy between the art and science in medicine. On top of that, there are workloads, paper, uh, increased demands and so on from the public. So uh, the other part of uh, modern medicine is uh, in hospital institutions that we have created. This picture that you see on the slide is one of the emergencies in um, uh, the biggest uh, hospital in the country. This is the emergency. As you can see, this is in hospital. And I see hospitals like uh, Marshall for Healing. And gradually from time to time, we are shifting from giving care to uh, giving a cure. And it's far away for us to, to provide person-centered care. Still, we are practicing a physician-centered process. So basically we are giving cure. There is no problem in the modern world to reach out a diagnosis or to give uh, good drugs or to do good surgeries, but the care is not uh, around. There are some changes that you see in hospitals, but these are uh, mere aesthetic improvements as far as I'm concerned. So uh, these are two important examples that you see on the slides. Abraham Verges had a talk on uh, the TED.com, and it was a very nice uh, interview. At that circumstance, he was telling us that at all times, patients would need to be listened and touched. They are not coming to you to get good drugs or to have sophisticated surgeries. The very important purpose of them coming to us is to be touched and listened. So you can see the current rounds and bedside teachings. They are really touching us from patients. The second good example is the experience of Helen Crispy. She was um, a nurse who had hysterectomy that was really coupled with medical errors and so on. But you know, she was in the hospital for a very long period of time, for months and months, 
and nobody knew her name. The only uh, uh, preference for her is the room number that she was in the ICU. So everybody was calling her, you were the patient in room number two. No identity concerned and nothing. She was not a person for them. So these days we are calling patients not on their name, but on the disease they have. So if uh, the person has a goiter, neck swelling, bring the goiter patient, not the patient by name or by identity. But you know, if you go deeper to uh, illness, to sickness, to disease, we have the other side of illness. People have a lot of stories to tell you. Not only the disease process uh, uh, per se, but uh, there are other things like the cultural religious beliefs they have, the psychological factors in rehabilitation based example could be cleft lip and palate. They have a stigma, self-stigmatization or uh, stigmatization from the outside world. There are problems with educational, vocational things, workplace problems. They have their own frustrations, expectations, satisfaction with the intervention. And also we cannot underestimate the economical burden. So every patient, every person in this world has a story to tell. And it's up to us to really focus on the story of um, those people so that we can understand them. We can understand the human being, we can understand the society. So basically what I believe is uh, medical care should ultimately end up in giving us healing healing of the body and healing of the soul. During all times, physicians were not able to diagnose because of the less advanced technology. Maybe they didn't have uh, sophisticated surgery and instruments, but they had something to offer to the patients. They had, they had sympathy and empathy to offer. They were empathetic. And uh, this picture is depicting the painting. The doctor was really uh, as um, emotionally engaged as the parents. An eight-year-old uh, child on the chair, sick, and uh, parents were devastated. And the doctor was really, really immersed into the emo emotional, emotional um, thing, deep into the emotion. So these doctors were empathetic. And as medicine advanced, we lost the good armor that we had, the art of listening, the touching, listening to patients and also understanding the cultural and other aspects of illness has gone. So we have become natural scientists. These two people lived in a difference of 2000 years, but they said the same thing. We better treat the person than treat the disease. And a good doctor treats the disease, a great physician treats the patient who has a disease. William Osler from University of John Hopkins University. The same description was from Hippocrates. The whole person, we have to understand the whole person, but we fail to understand because we don't have that armor that could, give, that could be obtained from the study of humanities. So the dichotomy is there. For me, medicine is, has lost the art part of medicine. Now it's a science. And there is some practical clinical application of the art of delivery, but I don't see the art as art in terms of culture, in terms of psychology and so on that is incorporated in our medical practice. So I'm a strong proponent of introducing humanities in medical care. The dichotomy, this is probably one of the areas that we have to investigate. Is it because natural scientists are not, are having a very different kind of brain function, brain utilization rather, that we forget the society, we forget the human being. So I'll take you to a brain model. The right uh, left hemisphere model uh, is a structural model where you have this uh, access to right, access to left, this uh, lateralization of the brain. So the intuition, the creative, and uh, so on are on the right side for right handed people. The opposite is for the left hand. So the analytic part is the uh, left part for right hand people. And the natural scientists are, tend to use more of analytic processes in their thinking process. Uh, so this was a very uh, critical time, 1974, when uh, Roger Sperry came up with, uh, with how the two hemispheres are functioning. At times they, they work parallel, simultaneously, and at times there is a very different, uh, uh, clearly delineated function when it comes to specific uh, activities. So you have this lateralization and you have the intuition the holistic perception, random sequencing, emotional thoughts, nonverbal, 
impulse, creativity on the right side for right hand people. And on the other side, you have the analytic thought. That is very important for natural scientists. The verbal, and, and sometimes, you know, the verbal, for example, the word can come from the left, but the toning of the word would come from the right side. So even by producing a single word, you can have an input from both hemispheres. Like if you put uh, some tone on your, on, your, on your word. So this lateralization, I think, is very important to investigate. And it might have some relevance for uh, people in natural science. This is uh, also a very different uh, use of the brain in uh, social sciences. Maybe the storytelling process we talked about and also exposing uh, to cultures, to the different humanities, music and so on, history, philosophy, would it somehow allow us to access the right hemisphere so that we can understand the society. This was uh, Betty Edwards who translated this uh, uh, the R model, left-right model, and she came up with uh, some uh, techniques how to knock down the left hemisphere and access the right hemisphere. This is also a, a freely available book on the net. This uh, paper um, summarized the importance of uh, accessing the two brains, the right and left hemisphere in education, so that you can have an imagination, visualization, physical exercise. So it uh, underlines uh, the importance of using both hemispheres. So I'm really questioning myself in medical training, would I be successful in uh, letting uh, my students to access both brains. So humanities has been there and uh, still it is very beneficial for us. The first part is, is there any benefits that we get from uh, humanities in terms of training? So uh, a lot of strategies has been going globally. Uh, the universities in the North America and Europe uh, have incorporated uh, the various uh, uh, elective and uh, uh, revised curriculum to introduce uh, study of arts for medical students. Uh, but still, it's lagging in uh, low and middle income country, including Ethiopia. There are some movements to introduce this uh, compassionate, respectful, and uh, caring uh, concept in medical care, which is basically a behavioral thing. And I think it cannot, you cannot achieve it with lectures. That's why we don't see any significant improvement. My country has launched CRC for the last six years, but I think there is no much, um, much uh, big outcome when it comes to the program. Medical humanities, this is part of um, the humanities, study of humanities, but it's trying to relate medicine with this um, hum humanities, social sciences and the arts. So it is using the imaginative processes. And recently I was, um, as I was reading on um, narrative medicine. So this is also another venture that you could see a very strong relationship of literature and medicine. This is uh, an armor that you can under listen to stories, interpret, and also emotionally engaged, understand, and act. And also it's um, important uh, discipline when it comes to understand the ethical dimension of medical practice. We have a lot of dilemmas. We have a lot of um, issues and only when we are, can understand the society that we will have a good appreciation of the ethical dimension. And we have to incorporate the subjective experience of patients. The objective experience is the one we are doing every day. And unfortunately, traditional medical training is not, is not incorporating this kind of um, uh, training on medical humanities. So, the study of goal of uh, medical humanities is number one, you understand the human aspect of medicine, the other side of illness, the totality of suffering would be understood. You try to relate medicine with creative arts, and also ultimately one of the advantages to be an insightful and compassionate doctors. So uh, we are far away from being compassionate, insightful. We could be good doctors, we could be good surgeons, but we are far behind from achieving a compassionate level that is expected from, from society. There are some interventions like uh, music engagement, visual art therapy, movement-based uh, creative expression, expressive writing or narrative medicine. 
With this, you can achieve a lot of things, both for the patients and for the practitioners. This journey, the journey in the medical practice is not the journey of the patient alone. It's our journey, it's the suffering of both of us. So with this, you can have a healing emotional injury. We are, we are injured as doctors, as nurses, as healthcare providers in front of the patient, we are emotionally affected because we are exposed to the very suffering of a human being. So we heal, both of us would heal. We understand each other. We understand, we understand the patient, the patient will understand us. And also we'll have the capacity to have a self-awareness and self-reflection. We can have also reduced symptoms like burnouts and depression and also the, the inclination for suicide, which is three times higher in medical professionals uh, than the rest of the world the community. And ultimately, this would be our behavior and technique, thinking pattern. So in medicine, art has contributed. The fine art particularly has contributed in terms of uh, medical training. This is a sketch by uh, a painting by Rembrandt from uh, Dutch, uh, reflecting how anatomy of the hand was studied. Da Vinci left us a lot of uh, sketches, anatomical sketches, and he was also the one who was dissecting uh, cadavers even in the time that was not allowed. So there was an extensive um, uh, art products from this guy from Italy, a very versatile person. Uh, you can have also the, this uh, book, Grey, Grey Anatomy, it has, it has gone through several editions. And it's still one of the best uh, anatomy book. You have also Andre Vasilis, uh, a clear uh, depiction of the anatomy of the hand. William Hunter had a lot of uh, uh, sketches, a lot of sketches, particularly sketches related to gynae and Ops practice. This was the time before the advent of photography. I can't, uh, I can't, um, uh, it's very important now to talk about this guy. This is uh, uh, Charles Bell, an educator and a neurologist who had a lot of sketches and a lot of uh, products that were so helpful for his uh, the students and patients. Some of the, his uh, paintings really showing the degree of suffering of the patient. Not only he depicted the disease process, but also you can see the suffering of the patients, the emotional expression of the patients. Such a detail works from him, very important for uh, medical doctors, were brought by Charles Payne. Frank Nitzer, this guy contributed about 4,000 products and uh, almost most uh, anatomy atlases are, are produced by uh, Frank Nitzer. Frank Nitzer was from New York initially. He went to um, the um, designer school. He became an interior designer with the mother. His mother pushed him to be a doctor and he went to medical school, he finished his uh, MD, but he couldn't stay long in medical practice. And he saw his last patient in 1934. He produced uh, 4,000 pictures, he uh, worked for SIBA. He was a major contributor when it comes to a study of anatomy globally. So undoubtedly, uh, humanities contribute to the medical training, at least from the examples that I showed you, the art, the fine arts really contributed to our training. Is there any benefit for practice? Yeah, this is uh, the practitioners. You know, what we are lacking is some of the skills like communication skill. We don't have the original skill. And we are not that much culturally sensitive to the patients. There are issues related to the clear ethical values. The respect between patient and doctor has been eroded and it's far, we are far away from achieving empathy. And our decision-making process is purely biomedical. From the data that we have from lab and imaging data, we decide, but that decision-making is not involving the patient. It is we, this, we know everything for you, is our motto, our understanding is that. So our decision-making is a unidirect directional from our side. But if this is improved through humanities, we can achieve so many things like imagination, self-awareness, creativity, even burnout would be reduced. We could be empathetic and we'll have a pleasurable experience and ultimately you can achieve a person-centered care. 
This was a study done on uh, medical school, medical students, and uh, after the introduction of uh, study of humanities, the, clearly they found that they had, the student had a good observational skill, they were communicating better, and also they were emotionally engaged with the patients. And they went back, the authors went back to see the life of some of the giant surgeons. And all those giant surgeons had, had humanities as part of their, um, their, um, their skills, their lifestyle. So these are giants, pioneers in most of the surgeries, and still they were also deep into the humanities. This is another study on medical training. The same thing is achieved. People could understand sickness, they could reconnect. They also understand illness. You know, as I said before, disease, illness, and sickness is very different. And also if this study uh, confirmed a very strong physician-patient relationship. And students were able to understand the other side of illness. Their visual capacity has been increased. And they were able to describe lesions, uh, patients' uh, emotional reaction from the body change and so on were properly uh, uh, picked by the medical doctors. There's another study which uh, showed more or less similar findings. These are three studies using the visual uh, uh, training strategic model. And the same thing, this is just by training our vision. The art of looking into things could give us also this kind of advantage like diagnostic capacities, listening capacity, the capacity to reflect, and also to team up, to work together, to be sensitive in culture. These are all been, been achieved by, you know, getting exposed to uh, the visual art. Narrative medicine, this is a very new venture, probably it's uh, about 22 years old. Uh, it was uh, established in, um, in, uh, in uh, uh, Columbia University by Rita, Rita Sharon. So this is the act of listening to patients, a storytelling process. Both are involved with patients and uh, 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 care providers are involved deeply into the story. They, are, they absorb, interpret, communicate, and it's both directional. And this would give you a very different knowledge, the narrative knowledge, which is also in, including the logical scientific knowledge. It, it goes beyond this. And um, you would be sensitive to the biopsychosocial culture of medicine. And you have four situations. This narrative, the storytelling process, the process of exchanging the storytelling thing could be between patient and physician, which gives you the empathetic environment. It could be within yourself. You would have self-awareness and self-reflection, and you go on improving it. You also share the stories with your colleagues, and you will have professional development. And also, you share the stories with the society, and the society will develop trust. So narrative medicine is one of the things that we, we should really focus. This is a contribution of literature in medicine. So there are, um, there are so many studies that also reflect the advantage of humanities at all age, at all age into every kind of disease processes, be it from an infectious disease to a, a degenerative um, uh, nerve problem like stroke, Parkinson's, name it, even a very rare uh, neurological condition. So it, it is applicable and it's beneficial in all circumstances, in prisons, in hospitals, in uh, mental health institutions, in rehabilitation center, in all age groups, studies ref uh, clearly uh, showed the benefit of humanities in medicine. If I give you an example of advantage of humanities arts in medicine, kids would have the capacity to cope with the stress of illness and to adapt to, to the medical environment. Music, for example, has shown a high rate of um, uh, weight gain in premature infants. And uh, infants were able to tolerate painful procedures. And uh, there was a reduced fear and anxiety in the treatment process in children. Let's take you to advantage in adults, just to give you some examples. There are people with post-traumatic stress syndrome, and these people have been benefited from exposure of art. 
you know, music can control the blood pressure, can control the your heart rate. It could be temporary, but if you do it continuously, mm -hmm. depending upon the kind of music that you listen to, your cardiovascular system, your heart and blood pressure would respond, would respond into a, a good beneficial uh, situation. So non-communicable diseases, there is no doubt of the benefit of humanities. As I said before, people with stroke and other uh, neurological conditions, a study found that their creativity may not improve, but their uh, capacity that is achieved at that period of time may not be lost. So they would still be active. They would still play music. I'm talking about perhaps if you have a, a major neurological condition that is involving your lips and so on, that could be a very different story. But in major circumstances with a stroke and so on, people could live a good quality of life. So it's up to us to offer them a good quality of life. Life is too short, but still enjoyable. However, whatever happens to us, this world is still beautiful. It's up to us to give them a good uh, quality of life. And one window or doors that I could think of is the humanities. Medical therapy with arts also gives you a positive distraction. People with sickness, people who are ill are always, uh, you know, think of, uh, um, think of the negative things like they are nearer to days, uh, you know, all the bad things are always coming to their mind. So yeah, they need some kind of positive distraction. They, are, they should be expressed, uh, they should express their emotion. They should express the uh, effect of their therapy. And particular intervention could also be taken like educational. They could also be therapy, like you can introduce art therapy, music therapy, and so on. The healing process would be fast and ultimately quality of life would be improved. There are people with permanent disability of different kinds, but these people should not be left behind from the society. They should be able to give quality of life. If preferable, they should have an active life when it comes to the economics, the social and psychological aspect of life. Our health institutions are dehumanizing. This is one of the biggest hospitals in the country where I, I did my training also where I teach now. It's a very big, huge hospital and you can see the gadgets and so on in the wards. You can see the cylinders, you have this um, uh, uh, monitors with a lot of sounds and so on. Really, our health institutions are de dehumanizing. We, we are detached from, from nature. We have nothing resembling our house when you go to hospitals. You can see this lady left alone. You can imagine how she's feeling now. And also you can see uh, this is probably relatives coming to visit uh, patients. These are the hospitals that we are working in. So they are humanizing into, uh, because of three problems. They are highly institutional. They are like prison. And also they are highly technological. And the people working there, the system that's established and the major goal of the hospitals is biomedical, nothing else. The human body is miniature and disease is like uh, cause and uh, effect. You have malaria parasite, you have malaria. You treat the malaria, you give drugs, that's it. And nowadays we have this medicalization of a society with medical iatrogenesis. So the dynamism is really frightening. We have so many things incorporated in the face of this kind of institution. So we have to make this uh, institutions human and uh, intervention is institutional, technological and biomedical. Humanizing uh, health institutions is not a, a new story. It's been there for quite a long time, more than 300 years back. People also started, you know, changing um, those health institutions. And some people are suggesting that the hospital should be changed into something like a hotel. Why would you have a fence in your hospital? What if the hospital didn't have any fence and the neighbors are really walking in, sitting with a patient, talking? The patient would have a story to tell them. And also the neighbor, people in the neighborhood would have also the story to tell the patients. 
But our hospitals have fences. It's like a prison. And uh, even you can change it something else, something pleasurable. So making it non-institutional is very important. Probably scaling them down, changing the models, separating them with buildings. If you have a small four-story building here for a purpose, then you'll have market and so on. Also houses, residence, and then you'll have another one. And they should be navigatable. They should also address the privacy of patients. So those big hospitals that I have in my country are not navigatable. Even I don't know some places in the hospitals. And also it's better to promote the value of art as a humanizing agent. So a proper internal design would uh, make these hospitals really hospitable. The second part is non-technological. It's better to hide. You know, we have reached to a technology whereby all those machines and so on can be modified in such a way that we don't notice the technological influence of those things. So the sensor, sensor scape, how you sense the three-dimensional sensations that you have about the surrounding can be improved. And finally, with the introduction of humanities, when you understand the other side of illness, then your intervention will not be biomedical. It would be a holistic, the true holistic approach will come with humanities. When a person understands man and the society, then that person would be a non-biomedical. So the interior design, for example, can be a good intervention. You can consider the corridors like galleries. You can also put um, um, creative designs. You have to think of uh, aesthetic dimensions of medical equipments. The equipments can be, these equipments are printed three-dimensional. So it is possible to change the design of those equipments in such a way that people do not feel that they are in the hospitals. You can even change certain areas, you know, the pediatric area, the emergency and so on, into a, a very different color and the graphics. That's pleasurable. And as I said before, make the hospitals a public space. Open them. People should walk in. And if possible, change it to hotels. So we have to understand the healing power of nature. Nowadays, we are detached from nature and we are biomedical. I think we are full. So the value of spaces, the spaces to reflect our feeling where are, we are unwell is very important. Creating a cheerful environment would distract us from our illnesses. So it's up to us to also change the hospital uh, uh, architecture and design in such a way that it reflects a holistic model. We should provide patients sense of control a bodily comfort, we don't put them into a prison. Even prisons should be changed into a more pleasurable places. The external view, natural lights, the acoustics, the fragrance, all this would contribute to the well-beingness of your patients. And also the kind of color, the space that you give, the private space that you give to patients. I'm talking this based on my reviews of literatures. The human hospitals, they are small, navigatable, architecturally familiar to where we believe, in what house we believe, and nicely decorated. And depending upon the culture, in African cultures, for example, the ordinary house in the rural area is quite different. So changing the hospital's architecture into that resemblance is very important. And also we have to follow this, uh, our eye, the visual world, that we are naturally created for follows the rule, like the golden rule for that matter. So you shape the size of the windows and so on really matters. So we have to go deep into the design of these institutions. Color is very important. The color, uh, depending upon the kind of colors that you use, it might reduce stress. You have to be very careful the kind of color, also color used. Some colors could be disturbing, but generally, when it's properly selected, properly uh, complemented, you have all these advantages that uh, you can see. It reduces um, stress, it improves sleeping, a well being as will improve. The patient will stay a short period in the hospital. And also, people, when they are going to the hospital, they have disorientation. Those big institutions, uh, they give them disorientation. So the disorientation would be reduced. And also it diminishes medical errors to your surprise. 
So color, use of proper color in hospitals would be advantageous. Other therapies can be included. Aromatherapy, art therapy, music therapy, art and music therapy, particularly in medical institutions, in pediatric institutions is very important. The use of uh, change environment of pediatric hospitals is uh, very important to be um, uh, considerate of the age of the patients. So we have to conceptualize the different ages uh, because what you do for a five-year-old would be very different for a 16-year-old um, young girl. So as I said before, we have to treat um, hospitals like galleries and we have to change them to something pleasurable so that people would be distracted from their uh, illnesses, including children. In summary, uh, the role of um, humanities, the role of art, art as a component of modern medicine is no more existing now. This is my personal view. Uh, it's better to explore how the brain is functioning. And uh, there is clear evidence that humanities would give you a remarkable advantage in terms of acquiring skill, in terms of the ability to express behaviors and other advantages. These advantages we talked about so far could be related to the patient, could be related to the training, could be related to the healthcare provider. And also it can include also the humanizing process of health institutions. These are my references. I would like to uh, to acknowledge uh, certain organizations, my families, my friends, people from the art school, including my teachers, and also the various organizations that uh, invited me to talk on the same subject. And also finally, I would like to thank you, Dr. Raf, and also your institution, Institution of Human Humanities in Africa for inviting me to give you, uh, it for, for inviting me. This is an opportunity for me to share with you what I think. So I would like to thank you. Uh, and finally, this is uh, uh, my gallery. Is it coming? Uh, this is my gallery, it's in my house. So I have also a corner for uh, painting. I do, I do uh, oil paint most of the time uh, and also photography. Thanks so much. Raf, thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Atakliti. That was a very thorough and humane presentation. So thank you very much. And um, I'll ask you to stop uh, sharing your screen and we'll go back to our, to our videos. Thank you. Great. Um, is, there, is there anyone in the audience who would like to ask a question or make a comment? You can use the little um, reactions emojis on the bottom of the screen to raise your hand if you would like to, um, to say something, make a contribution, ask a question. Let's see. We have some applause. <laughs> And um, I'll wait for uh, for someone to respond. But yeah, no, I was I was caught by you know many of the things that you said, and I noticed that uh, Rembrandt, the anatomy lesson painting, um, was also on the wall of the orthopedic surgery clinic that I'm collaborating with at Tigerberg Hospital in Cape Town. It's it's one of our biggest public hospitals, and I'm collaborating with an orthopedic surgeon there. And in their um, break room, they also have the Rembrandt, the anatomy lesson. And I took a photograph of it there. Something that's, that they do, which maybe may relate to what you've mentioned, is that they're using new technology to scan and 3D, 3D print uh, bones and joints. And then they use their surgical tools to practice surgery on the 3D printed model before they do it on the patient. Uh, so that they can simulate a difficult case and practice it. And when you talked about the potential of the arts to refocus on the craft of medicine, um, to connect the, the, the doctor back to the craft, it's interesting, and in the face of technology, I think it's interesting what they're doing because they're managing to combine new technology 
with craft uh, because they get to use their hand skills and their normal instruments um, on a 3D printed model. So they're doing a form of simulation, but it's um, still utilizing their hand skills rather than replacing them, which is the other use of, say, surgical robots that take away from the, uh, the craft of the surgeon. Um, and have you, have you embraced any new forms of technology in your work that you think are beneficial? You know, are there examples of ways in which new technology is complementary to um, the skill of the surgeon? Um, thanks so much, Rafa. I think um, we should start with whatever we have now. The basic thing is, you know, literature was with us, fine art was there, dance, uh, music, drama, and so we have been having it for uh, from the time of immemorial to the present time. So the first thing is to explore whatever is available here. So unfortunately, we, are, we have not yet been ready to introduce it. But you know, the storytelling processes, uh, the art of listening, the various skills that you can you can introduce uh, is the first that we have to explore. This is a very cheap, but it is effective and available to us. So working with people from art school, from school of music, working with people in humanities from the social sciences, working with writers, novel writers, I'm sure you must have had uh, the talk of uh, Oliver Sacks. This was a, a very uh, remarkable person who was contributing to the medical humanities. Each and every patient is a book. Yeah. So uh, it's better to start with um, what we have. As a society, we have all this. Any society, any society has that culture of listening, listening to stories, listening, and also this uh, art and so on, as I just uh, tried to express with this uh, painting in South Spain, uh, art was there, the painting was there. So you can start with whatever you have. The thing that you mentioned about the 3D, it is basically a skill training. I'm not sure if it is, um, if it can contribute to, the, to this uh, uh, understanding of the other side of illness. It is basically uh, a skill. Uh, actually, if you go to the West, to the developed world, that's how they do. If you do mandibular reconstruction first, you do the cutting and so on, on a 3D print. But this is beyond. I'm sure you understand me. You are from the art side. So mm -hmm. my failure as a doctor is I don't understand the patient. I don't understand the society that the patient comes from. But I'm trying to understand only the disease process. As a surgeon, I focus on the pathology. That's all. That should be changed. Yes. No, I think that, um, yeah, it was clear in your presentation that you're valuing what the arts and humanities have to offer in a more holistic view of, of relationships and of care. Um, and, and in fact, the research project that I'm part of also includes the idea of an ethics of care. So yeah, we are, we're, we're very interested in that, that dimension. Um, I see a question in the chat, which I think you've partially, you, you have partially um, uh, answered even just now, but it's, uh, it's asking, how do you propose the humanities be integrated into medical education, especially in a country such as ours? I'm not sure if ours is um, Ethiopia or South Africa from the questioner there. Meron Thanks, Mulat. question. Uh, yeah, I, I got the question. Uh, what I believe is uh, it, it should have a short term, long term, and uh, uh, a medium term uh, phase. Nowadays, we are not practicing the medical humanities. There is no humanity concept in the medical uh, training program in our curriculum and so on. We are focusing on the disease, that's it. So what I think is, it's better to work with now with uh, people from the literature and from the arts. They don't know our world. We don't know their worlds. So we should come, sit and exchange our worlds. So the best approach could be, you know, using the uh, paintings to study uh, the details. So that will have this observational capacity, communication skill and so on. We can also uh, write a story of patients together with writers then sharing the stories. So we can start with simple thing and later on, 
people can take it as uh, their own specialty fields. Doctors can take uh, humanities, medical humanities as subspecialty or specialty. But in the short term, it's better to take three, probably three areas like music, uh, literature, and fine arts as an entry point and work with those people. So it requires an initial uh, brainstorming and dialogue because they don't understand also what they could contribute, mm -hmm. understand their benefits. So we should sit and explore our roles, the common roles that we have. And it's very easy to do that. Then it will grow by itself. This is uh, what I could say. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think I'd, I'd like to, I'm, I'm going to come to another question in the, uh, in the chat, but just to say something a bit broader, which is that I think that arts, the arts, including music and visual art and performance, have been taken away from people, not just from medicine, but from society in a wider sense in the West and in modernity, because it, there's an observation that um, in older societies, everyone could sing or everyone could participate in the production of music and arts. And it's something that's happened in the West and in modernity is that the arts have become specialized. So you become a musician or you become an artist as a specialized practice. And it, and it has lost some of its place as a broad cultural activity that everyone takes part in. So I think that, yeah, it should, it should form part of a broader idea as well, of, um, as well as the particular application in medicine it's also something that society at large should be participating in more. Um, I think this is also related to all other um, natural sciences. If you take, for example, uh, civil engineering hmm. or uh, such kind of things, you know, you see a very marvelous uh, out output, but uh, often you don't see that the human aspect, the societal aspect. Hmm. So they are suffering like us. Yeah. They are focusing on the natural aspect, the science. But whatever you are producing should be related to, to, um, to the society, to the people, to yourself. Yes. So the things that you construct should be human. The doors, are, the, the, the roads that you construct should be human. The buildings that you produce should be human. Should should uh, should give pleasure to the public, to the society. Mm. So it's a very broad term. So I think not only for medicine, but also for for other natural sciences, this humanities should be incorporated. We have failed to understand a human being in a society. There is one yes. question that I'm asked. This yes. is uh, how I'm inspired. Uh, you know, I have been uh, doing this painting for uh, so many years with some interruptions, but the last interruption was for 14 years. And uh, I restarted it uh, some eight, eight, eight years back. And uh, then I you know through my reading, particularly um, the, historical way of training artists and surgeons were similar. So with those articles, I started digging and with luck, I would say, I found a very strong relationship of humanities with medicine. Then I took myself deeper into a narrative medicine, the storytelling. And finally, I concluded that I was in a box. I'm sure my friends are also in similar positions. So it's uh, this circumstance of getting access to some literatures that describes the strong relationship of humanities with medicine that opened up my, my door, a new door. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for answering that question from Chikezi. Um, yeah, and I also love your recommendation of Oliver Sacks. I also love his books. And there's a great... Um, documentary about uh, Oliver Sacks towards the end of his life, a, very, a really fascinating figure who combines all these attributes. Um, so we are actually at the end of our, our seminar. So if there are no further um, questions or comments, then we will, uh, we will wrap up. And thank you very much for adding so much to our work here in, in looking at the relationship of humanities and medicine. Um, I really enjoyed your, your talk. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for, for spending time with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you. And uh, thank you everyone who participated here. We had a great crowd uh, here in the room and this will also be watched by many people later 
um, on YouTube and on our Facebook page. So thank you for listening. This has been an attire uh, seminar uh, hosted by Huma, the Institute for Humanities uh, in Africa here at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Thank you very much and good night. <laughs>